consider it an immense blessing to serve at Emmaus, considering the strong foundation that's been laid here before I ever got here. As one particular example, when I came to Emmaus, you already had a tradition of solid expositional preaching. So when I came, I didn't feel the need or I, I didn't have to sort of persuade you of that. You know the power of expositional preaching, even if you don't know it by that name. That's what you know. Uh, by that sort of preaching, I, by systematic expositional or expository preaching, I know it sounds big, but it's very simple. It's like what we're doing with First Peter. We're simply working our way through a book in its entirety, every word, every verse, and we're simply opening it up and explaining it to you. So there's, there's no fancy gimmicks. There's, there's, I'm not picking and choosing a bunch of things. I'm not simply coming up here and speaking to you for you know, a half hour or 45 minutes, but rather I'm just simply opening up the word to you. And one of the practical benefits, although that's also the, the biblical type of preaching, I would say, that's what God's word teaches us to do when we preach. But a, a thing that I want to say practically that does is it decreases the opportunity for the preacher to get on a soapbox, sort of ride his hobby horse and preach the same thing or to sort of whatever is sort of striking his fancy that week or that month. The other thing it does on the other side is it takes away the temptation or it removes the power of the temptation and the preacher to skirt around controversial issues. We are, as pastors, as preachers, as ministers, called to preach the whole counsel of God. All of it. All those things that are difficult to understand, that are difficult to apply. All those things that we, we think we understand. We are to preach the whole counsel of God. And my message this morning is called preaching the S word. In our text, Peter continues his discourse on Christian submission, the S word. God has instituted order in the world and Christians submit to God when they submit to that order, to that authority. We've seen that all through chapter two. So you're, you're familiar with that by now, the sorts of authorities that we see at the national level, state, city authorities, uh, at, at a business, at school, all those sort of authorities that God himself in his providence, in his omniscience, in his wisdom has placed over us. Uh, Peter addresses here family in chapter three, where we are today, speaking specifically of marriage, husbands and wives and how they relate to one another. Let's read the text. First Peter chapter three, beginning in verse one. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husband so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter says here, very simply, wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should honor their wives. Quite straightforward. In our response to the word this morning, as we apply it to our lives, and I tell you that up front, uh, the first thing that I have to acknowledge though is that not all of us are married. Some of us are at different stages in life. Some of us are in different contexts. But this word speaks to all of us this morning. The Holy Spirit speaks to all. To the married, he says, let us boldly and sacrificially obey God by fulfilling our mutual calling to one another as spouses. But to everyone, married or unmarried, let's submit to God by submitting to whatever order and authority he places over us. In this, we must trust God to guide us. We trust God to sustain us through that. And even in difficult situations, even in situations of injustice, we trust God one day to vindicate us. Let's pray for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, 
Master, we submit to you above and beyond any worldly order. You are good and holy. God, you love us. You sent your son to die for us. And Holy Spirit, you are the seal of our salvation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make your word clear to us this morning. Work among us. Build up your church. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So there are really two parts to my message, and they, they're quite clear in the text there. You can see the first six verses, Peter's speaking to wives. And then secondly, he's speaking to husbands, to men. But the first several verses, verses one through six, he's speaking to wives. Peter tells women, married women, wives to do four things. In verse one, the first part of verse one contains the first. Look there with me. Likewise, wives... Be subject to your own husbands. As I said a moment ago, God's ordering of the world includes even the institution of marriage. We shouldn't be surprised by that, of course, the the preciousness and the importance of the institution of marriage in the scriptures. We know the broader theological significance of marriage, don't we? The picture of of the husband and the wife illustrated, uh, illustrates the relationship between Christ and his church, the bride being the church and the bridegroom being Christ and the intimacy, the relationship there, how Christ lays down his life, that, that beautiful biblical theology laid out there. So we, we know some of that background. The, the language here is identical to what we see in chapter 2 when it says to be subject to submit to earthly authorities and so on. So it's the same idea as those of you who've been with us through those other messages. Uh, it's the same idea following here. But what does he mean by this when he tells wives to submit to their husbands? Very practically. What is is Peter saying and what am I preaching to you today? What is the takeaway here? I want to tell you up front. The fact is it's actually fairly simple. It's not really complex. And whenever you hear me say that, you go, oh, that's good. (laughs) We like hearing that. We don't like things that are complex. It's very simple at the level of understanding. Understanding what the text is saying. John Piper does such a good job of boiling this down to very simple expression. And so I I think his definition here is helpful as he reflects on this particular passage. He says, a wife who submits to her husband honors and affirms his leadership. Very simply, she honors and affirms his leadership. Key word, underline leadership there. Submission between a wife to her husband is a disposition and inclination. So these are matters of the heart to yield to his leadership in the home. In this, the wife delights in the husband taking the initiative in the home to lead. Again, the heart here is so important. This kind of godly uh, submission proceeds from a renewed heart. It proceeds in no other way a heart that has been radically changed by the Holy Spirit. When the unregenerate heart hears this, it naturally resists. It says, no, no, it says. It even rages against it. The unregenerate heart doesn't understand this because this is not of the flesh. This is holy. It's of God. So very simply, wives, honor and affirm your husband's leadership and submission. That's what it means. But saying that now, hopefully saying very plainly what it is, let me say a couple things that this is not saying, what submission in this context is not. Number one, this passage is not teaching, listen closely, this passage is not teaching that women are to be subject to men. Does it sound like I'm contradicting myself? I'm not. This passage is not saying that all women are to be subject to all men. Very uniquely, look, it says in there twice, be subject to your own husband. It says it later in the same way, be subject to your own husband. So a wife uniquely submits to her husband. The way my wife, Joy, submits to me is unique in every other relationship she has. She doesn't submit to other men in this church the way she submits to me. She doesn't even submit to her father the way she submits to me. There's a beauty here in marriage, in this relationship, again, depicted the the deep understanding that we see between Christ and the church, the way the church submits to Christ and he lovingly cares for her. This beautiful picture here is unique. So the woman does not submit to all other men. This is very different from what you would see in Islam, for instance. 
It's very different from what you'd see in other cultural manifestations that we sometimes read into it. The teaching is for a woman to submit to her own husband uniquely, lovingly following his leadership. So that's one thing that the text is not saying. The second thing is, of course, what we've seen before in chapter 2, that submission is never without limits except toward God. All earthly submission uh, obeys God first. All Christians obey God above and beyond all other earthly institutions. And so in a situation where a woman, a Christian woman, is in submission to her husband, but he is trying to lead her into sin, she obeys God rather than man. Even in that situation, though, and this is something that John Piper points out very helpfully on this passage. I happened to to see a video where he was speaking about this passage. And in that scenario, he speaks of how, how a woman, even in that, even when she has to say, no, I will not follow you into that sin, she does it with honor and respect. To say, it grieves me that you would ask me to lead, or that you would ask me to follow you into that sin, but I cannot, even as I respect your leadership. Wives, honor and affirm your husband's leadership, he says. Several weeks ago, I sat down over lunch with a, with a, a young man. Uh, he's not that much younger than me, but, but I'm sort of mentoring him. That's sort of the relationship. And we were talking about marriage, and um, he was looking to get engaged. And, and he was asking me some questions. And, of course, this, this issue came up, and he's asking me, you know, what, what, how do I deal with that? He's, he said, you know what, I just I don't really like that whole submission thing and the whole leadership thing. Can't we just be sort of peers and equals? And, you know, I just don't like the the responsibility and the difficulty. You know, I just, I I don't know how I feel about that. And I heard him out. And, and, and of course, it's not unique. I've heard that before. And I said, well, you know, brother, um, and I said this very gently, but I said there could be two things going on. Number one, it could be that you're just not ready to be married. If you are not willing to follow the scriptural guidelines for marriage, it might be that you're not quite ready to be married. And so you need to seek the Holy Spirit and allow him to change you and prepare you before you marry. Could be on the other hand, and I I don't remember exactly how I said this, but I said something effective. It could be that simply you're just not meant to be married, that God is calling you into singleness. God does that sometimes. Take note of the Apostle Paul. These things are very clear in the scriptures. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But we must obey these things. And using the excuse of I don't like that or, or it doesn't really fit my personality, it doesn't do justice. It doesn't take away God's call to holiness. here. Peter commands wives to submit to their husbands. But here he adds this weighty motivation. Did you see that? Look back to verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of of their wives. They may be one. Peter commands ladies, wives to win their unbelieving husbands. You know, this is always a goal for us as Christians. This is always a goal. We seek to win people to Christ. We make no apologies for that. For those of us who work in a broader secular field or are or, or dealing in those sort of contexts where we're not among other believers, uh, we know the warnings. You know, when I worked at the University of Louisville, I, I always had to, to watch out for the, the proselytizing clause. Make sure you're not proselytizing anyone. And we have to have wisdom in those situations. And I walked that line very carefully on one hand, trying to have integrity, but on the other hand, wanting to sustain my witness there. The fact is, as Christians, we are calling to win people to Christ. We believe we have the truth. And we believe those who do not have the truth face eternal judgment without Christ. How dare we not seek to win people to Christ? If we truly believe that hell is real, we truly believe the gospel is as sweet as the scriptures say it is, how could we not? That would be cruel. The lie that we are bigots if we're trying to impose our beliefs on others fails when we understand what the gospel teaches is always a goal for Christians. And that would certainly include those closest to us like a spouse, as we see here. It was common in the early church for the woman to come to Christ first. So, of course, for instance, here in Asia Minor, uh, in what is now Turkey, this was a pagan area. This, so most of the members of this church would not have had even Jewish backgrounds, certainly let alone Christian backgrounds. These are first-generation Christians. And so in a pagan household, oftentimes the woman would come to Christ first. 
a lot of it was just simply opportunity. The man's away working and she's able to, to, to be at home. And so oftentimes uh, people would evangelize to her. And so she would come to Christ first. And in that scenario, Peter gives this admonition. But it's not unique to the ancient world. I've shared with you the example of, uh, of a popular evangelical writer, Lee Strobel. He was an atheist. He uh, worked for the Chicago Tribune as a writer, had a good, comfortable middle-class lifestyle, but wanted nothing to do with God, wanted nothing to do with religion. He was happy with his wife and his kids, so that's all he wanted. His wife, being witnessed to by a friend, comes to faith in Christ, and she uh, comes and tells him, and he says, you know what, I didn't sign up for this, I don't want that, but you kind of do your little God thing, and as long as you don't bug me, you know, we'll be fine. And she sought to persuade him. She sought to, number one, yes, proclaim the gospel verbally, but then with her own testimony to live it out before him. And so for weeks and for months, he could not deny the fact that she was not the person she was before. And so her own example became this compelling picture of the gospel. And eventually, long story short, he comes to faith in Christ and becomes this powerful apologist for Christianity. Beautiful picture. Some of you have more personal stories. Maybe it was your spouse who won you to Christ. Or maybe in your, in your parents' relationship, it was one or the other, that one or the other to Christ, and thus you were raised in a Christian home. This happens today also. So I ask you, how are you seeking to fulfill this exhortation? Are you seeking to win those, especially those closest to you, to Christ? The implication here in the text is that the wife is speaking verbally, even though it's speaking about her example, her conduct. She's speaking verbally. She's sharing the gospel. But, you know, God sometimes, as I just said, uses personal examples to draw sinners to repentance. He can use a whole host of ways. Remember, our lives, as we've already seen here in 1 Peter, should add credence to our message. Church, you see how important our example is before unbelievers? They're always watching, good and bad. We need to pray for God's grace that we would live with integrity before them and live out in a way that, again, adds credence to the message that we're saying because our actions oftentimes speak louder than our words. A Christian wife who respects her husband and demonstrates pure conduct might win an unbelieving husband to Christ and oftentimes does in God's grace. It's possible that one of you here is in that very situation. If that is so, seek to win him to Christ. Seek to win her to Christ. Plead in prayer before the Lord and live in such a way that demonstrates the truthfulness of your testimony. But for all of us, men, women, married, unmarried, we apply this principle more broadly by seeking to live as a Christian example before unbelieving family members, before unbelieving people at work, your co-workers, your neighbors, and so on. Live out your faith. May your conduct add credence to the verbal proclamation of the gospel. Notice I keep saying that. You need both. Verse 3. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Verse 4, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Peter tells wives to, number three now, adorn the inside, not merely the outside. In this verse, we have to look a little deeper than the immediate reading to really get at what he's saying. Peter tells women basically here not to focus on the exterior at the expense of the interior. I said on social media earlier this week as I was reading this and as it was just as a, as a preacher, anyone who's preached knows how sort of the message burns in you all week. And I can't help sometimes but let out little, you know, little things on social media. One of the ones that I said this week was, if you're spending two hours, speaking to women, to married wives here, uh, to wives here in context, if you're spending two hours a day working on the exterior and five minutes on the interior, well, you're illustrating the very problem that he's bringing up here. So it's not saying that you're out, your exterior has to be ugly. It's not what he's saying, obviously. In our broader culture, the exterior is pretty much all you have, isn't it? 
the value of a woman in, in so much of our culture is by her exterior. How sad. But a Christian woman is not defined by how well-dressed she is. She's not defined by what she looks like on the outside. The adversary in a twisted society, a twisted culture, would like you to think that the outside is what matters first and foremost, or that it's all that matters. Well, God says otherwise. Your value comes not by the brand that you wear, or by the size that your exterior is, or by a host of other things that we think of as as beautiful, and oftentimes that is corrupt in our culture. The bottom line here is modesty, is humility. Ladies, don't seek to impress others with your exterior. Yes, take care of yourself. Yes, be healthy. Yes, honor your husband. But don't seek to impress others by your outward appearance. Rather, what does he say? Use your inner beauty to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You have that. Verse 4. Again, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Ladies, have you ever asked yourself, what does a godly woman look like? Maybe as you first became a Christian, you had to ask yourself, you know, I I don't know what a godly woman looks like. All I know is the examples I've, I've seen. Well, this is what a godly woman looks like. It says a a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious before the Lord. A Christian woman seeks to please God before anyone else. But some of you ladies might be thinking this inside. You might be saying to yourself, you know, preacher, I hear you and I, I see it in the text, but that's just not me. That whole quiet and gentle thing, that's just not me. It's not how I was raised. It's not, it's not in my makeup. I just, that's just not me. You know, men could say the same thing about their character, as I even illustrated earlier. A man could say, oh, you know, being a leader in the home, that's just not for me. I don't want the responsibility. I want the headache. I just want to do my thing. I just want to get home from work. I want to watch some football. I just, I don't want, I don't want the hassle. Just, just. Just leave me alone. I don't want that hassle. That's just not me. I'm more of a background type of person. You know, men can reject their role of leadership with passivity the same way that a woman can try to domineer and usurp authority in the home. So using the, that's not really me or that's not how I was raised or whatever, that, that, that doesn't do justice here and it doesn't take away the strength of this exhortation. I can think of so many illustrations in life of, of when you've seen this go wrong and it is always ugly. Even in that situation where a man is, is in a passive position and he lets his wife sort of domineer and he think, but even when the woman has to do that, she resents him because of it. It doesn't make her happy. God has written on our hearts something of this role that is good. So even in our sin, in our flesh, even for non-believers, there's something in us that tells us this isn't right. And it just leads to more problems. Now, as I say this, what what might be, and again, I'm not denying that you're saying that to yourself. In fact, I'm affirming some of you are really feeling that on either side here, man or woman. What might be true here is that it will be harder for you to achieve this because of your background, because of how you were raised, because of honestly your own DNA and makeup. We're fallen. We live in a broken world. It might be harder for you to achieve this. But listen to this. We do not achieve holiness. We do not pursue holiness in our own strength in any way, whether it's a role in the home or whether it's pride or whether it's lust. We don't pursue these things in our own strength. That's good news. In God's power and his grace, he transforms us from the inside. We call it sanctification. That's here for you. It's available. Give yourself to God. If that's you in this position, you're hearing that now and you're, and you're sort of resisting this, give yourself over to God in prayer and say, God, make your desires my desires. I hear what your word is saying. I understand it here, but God, would you in your grace and power translate it, transform me so that I can live it out, God. I can't do it on my own. That should be our disposition. 
God, would you give me a gentle and quiet spirit so that I can please you and be precious before you? We need that so badly. In these two verses, we're talking about a disposition of the heart. Over and over again, we see that language used here. Wives, affirm your husband's leadership. Support him. To all of us, let our lives be examples to unbelievers around us as we seek to win them to Christ. With no apologies, seek to win them to Christ. I said Peter tells wives to do four things. Here's the fourth. He tells women, married women, to follow godly examples. Look at verse five with me. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Peter looks here, he's, he's doing what, what, what I do oftentimes. He's illustrating his point. It's helpful to us. Peter looks to his historic examples of godly women here to, to draw examples here. He uses Sarah. Sadly, in our culture, and, I, and I'm not speaking about our church culture, but in just the broader American-ish culture, we have a terrible lack of appreciation for older examples. We really do. We, we need godly examples from older saints in our church. And we need younger saints to follow those examples, to learn from them. We need that. That's one of the reasons that a, a church that only has one age demographic is not healthy. A church that is all older people or all younger people or all hipsters, it's not healthy. You need older people to learn from. And oftentimes learning can go both ways, but the scriptures admonish us. Oftentimes we see it in, of course, in in Paul's writings. We need godly examples from those who have been through life and can teach the next generation. If you're an older believer, teach the younger. If you're a younger believer, have humility and learn from the older. We foolishly believe so often that we have little to learn from those older to us, and that's just nonsense. That's been true, uh, especially since the counterculture revolution of the late 1960s and 1970s, of course, which began here in the Bay Area. It's close to home. It's foolishness. It's folly. Beyond those living, though, again, importance of that, we we need those living uh, in our own church to, to model that. But beyond those living, we should look to church history, to the history of our faith for godly examples. Ladies, oh, there are so many. There are so many godly examples. I want to name just a few that you might look to. Look to women like Ann Judson, who was a missionary in Burma, who lived sacrificially and did incredible things to the Lord, ultimately giving her life on the mission field. Look to women like Elizabeth Elliot. Look to women like Monica, who was Augustine's mother, going back to the ancient church. Look to women like Macrina, also in the ancient church. Look to women closer to home, thinking of, of Baptist women of like Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong, just to name a few. There are so many godly examples out there, and I would love to give you resources to read about these women, to be inspired by them, as God would have us. But here we have an example from the Old Testament, so an, ex- an inspired example arising from this. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves and so forth. Holy women are those who have their eyes on God, the text tells us. Those who have faith in God. And so what about you? Does that describe you? Do you find your worth in God? Do you find your identity in him? Do you have your eyes fixed on him above and beyond anything else in this world? Sarah illustrates this godly conduct. Here, Peter commands. She submitted to her husband and honored him in speech and action. Notice here, she even called him Lord, and that just goes right over our head. We don't don't get that. We have so dispensed with any sort of titles in American culture with our sort of radical uh, egalitarianism. We're all equal. We don't even like to call our president by a title. We just call him Obama, right? We, We don't like titles. That makes us feel, you know, uneasy, Even in the church, sometimes we're uneasy. 
even, even as, I, as I think about that, you know, even, of course, those that come from Mexico and from, from Central America, basically anywhere but America, you know, they're, they're more familiar with that. But I even see in the second and third generation, those things are gone. You hardly ever even hear the usted form, ustedes. It, it's out the window. Señor, oh, no, it's gone. He's just dude. That's it. And so we, we are so, it's hard for us to understand that is, why, is what I'm saying. But this was a title of honor. Number one, it's not, it's not Lord like we would see with a capital L in the sense of, of a worship. She's obviously not worshiping him. We have our worship only to God, but it was a title of honor. Verse six, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So there's a broader theological point at work here. Ladies, you are the children of Sarah if you share the same faith that she does. Church, men, women, married, unmarried, we are the sons of Sarah and Abraham if we share the same faith they did. Let me tell you why that's important. This is not saying that we're the children of Abraham and Sarah if we're ethnic Jews. It's not saying that we're the children of Abraham if for men, if we're circumcised or, or if we follow the Old Testament law. It's not even hinting at that, very much so the opposite. The message here is if you share their faith, you are heirs of the promise. Genesis 12. And the promise coming to God's people. Such a beautiful picture. About 85% of this passage speaks to women, to wives. As we transition to the final part of the message, we see here that there's less content devoted towards men, but there is equal force, if not more force. So seeing the responsibility of wives toward their husbands, now we turn briefly to the responsibility of husbands toward their wives. Look at verse 7 with me. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter commands men to do three things. And the first one is this. Men, husbands, be considerate of your wife. This seems simple on the surface. Well, he better be considerate if I'm submitting to him, right? I mean, we, of course he should be considerate. But this was anything but obvious to the original recipients of this letter. Anything but obvious. To new Christians in antiquity, again, especially those coming out of a pagan background here in, in Asia Minor, Remember, this is, this is centuries before the modern idea of marriage as sort of a partnership, an, an emotional bond between uh, two sort of equals. Even, even that definition has some problems. I'm not going to chase that rabbit. But this is long before that. You realize a woman was basically property to her husband in the ancient world. I'm not affirming that. I'm stating that as a fact. It, 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 a woman was simply meant to take care of the home, to bear children, raise children. That's what a wife was. In fact, the, the father had to pay the husband for him to even take her. It was called a dowry. That's the context he's writing here. So for him to say, be considerate of your wife, that was radical. This, uh, this is not implying that, that men were, were cruel to their wives always, but they didn't go out of their way to consider their wife's feelings, for instance. Hey, honey, how are you feeling today? That didn't happen. The thing I want to emphasize here is that Peter is pushing hard upstream against the cultural norm. So the argument that says, oh, Peter, he's just just bound to his culture. He's saying all these sort of patriarchal things because he doesn't know any better. Same thing we say about Paul. Those accusations fall when you know anything about the cultural background. These are radical things that are saying, be considerate of your wives, men. Husbands. The Holy Spirit tells us to be sensitive to our wives, to be considerate of her needs, to be considerate of her health, to be considerate, yes, even of her preferences. This takes a great deal of effort. And I think sometimes as men, although we go, yeah, yeah, we need to be considerate. Yeah, we need to do that. We don't realize this takes a great deal of effort. This is not the default position. You realize that? In our fleshly nature, uh uh-uh. This is not the default. I, I know for me, uh, when I got married at, at 23, I had been a, you know, a bachelor on my own for more than four years. 
I had a house and I was working a job. I was going to school full time and I was pretty self-sufficient, pretty independent. I, I wasn't used to having to, to cater to other people. I came home when I wanted to, I cooked food when I wanted to. And, and I mean, I, I did my own thing. I just, that, that's, that's how life was. That's, you know, when you're, when you're batching it up, that's what you do. You know, if I wanted to hang flags around my house, I could do that. You know, it's cool. But when I got married, I knew as, as a man of God, you know, I've, I've got to be considered my wife and I need to, to learn things. And it was harder than I could have ever imagined. And it took two, three plus years. And my wife's saying, he's still not quite there yet. You know, <laughs> it's hard. It takes an effort. So men, give that effort. Be considerate of your wife, of her preferences, of her needs, of her feelings. It's the first thing he tells men. Second thing he says, in addition to being considerate of your wife, Peter admonishes us to honor our wives, men. He commands wives to be subject to their own husband, yes, but a husband must honor his wife. Husbands, do you show honor to your wife? That's another hard word. Do we even know what honor means today? Husbands, show honor to your wife. Do you honor her with your speech privately and publicly? There's an importance of sitting quietly and privately with your wife and just admonishing her, encouraging her, affirming her, loving her privately. But there's also that importance of doing it publicly as well when those opportunities present themselves. To speak about how wonderful she is, to speak about uh, these different things in a way that adds honor to her. Men, are you honoring your wife publicly and privately? This is a sacrificial calling to honor your wife with your conduct, to honor her with your attention, with your time. So we know that the the submission part for the wife is, is sacrificial. Yeah, it's sacrificial. You know, we hear that right away, but this is equally, if not more sacrificial because the husband in the role of leader, that takes an especial amount of self-sacrifice. Honor speaks of showing worth and value. Husbands, do you show worth and value to your wife? Do you treat your wife as someone valuable, as precious? Well, you need to. The text here refers to the wife as the weaker vessel. What, what, is, what is that about? Well, first off, Peter's not implying any sort of inequality here. We know so clearly from the book of Genesis that man and woman is created, uh, both created in the image of God, They're both equal recipients. We see here in the very verse, equal recipients of the gospel. So it's not speaking at all about the the equality of of man and woman when it speaks about one being weaker than the other. But what does it mean? Uh, Some would say, well, maybe perhaps it's speaking about um, emotional strength that a woman is more weak emotionally and so, so the man is to sort of be sensitive to that. I don't think it's speaking about emotional strength. In fact, there's some strength that goes into a woman being more transparent with her emotions rather than a man holding them in. I, I, don't, I don't think that's, that's what he's talking about. He might be referring to sort of just the, the very simple physical design that a man is stronger than a woman and so he should sort of protect her. That's, that's possible, but I think much more likely what he's speaking of here is the very simple fact that in this society, a woman had virtually no standing in society on her own. When she was very young, her father was her advocate, and when she's married, now her husband is her voice and her advocate in the society. She has virtually no power in and of herself. And so he's speaking about this protection that comes from the man over his wife, especially in this context. I think that's what it's talking about. So the principle here, then men take care of your wives. Third, lastly, the thing that he commands, treat them as, as I just implied, equal heirs of the gospel. Now, this reinforces the dignity of the wife as well. That she's a co-heir with Christ, the same as the husband. So men, remember, yes, she's your wife. Yes, she, she submits herself to you joyfully in the gospel, but she's also your sister in Christ. Uh, This brings up an an ancient um, accusation brought against the church. And of course, there were so many. I think I've shared this one with you. In the early church, of course, they understood very plainly that, uh, that, that men and women that in the family of God are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we understand that. We even use some of that verbiage here. And so sometimes a, a brother and a sister in Christ would get married. 
And even people here, you might, some of you met your spouse in this church. You understand that. You eventually get married. And so people on the outside who are always looking at these weird Christians and not understanding them go, wait a sec, they're brother and sister and they're married now? That's disgusting. And they, they didn't understand. They're not physically brother and sister. But the early church understood that they are brothers and sisters in Christ, even once they marry. Peter warns husbands here, this very stern warning. Do this, do these three things, or else you'll suffer spiritually for it. You see that there in the text. Wayne Grudem, one commentator, does such a good job of of explaining this. He says, so concerned is God that Christian husbands live in an understanding and loving way with their wives that he interrupts his relationship with them when they're not doing so. Men, God is not pleased with you and will not hear your prayers if you are not treating your wife in a godly way. That's a pretty stern warning. Again, that goes along with the leadership role of the man in the home. Husbands, be considerate of your wife. Honor her and treat her as the co-heir in Christ that she is. Now, as I said at the beginning, this passage speaks most directly to married women and men. But for those of you who are not married but are in that stage of life where you might or very likely will be married, this is the high calling that you would face. So you may say, well, yeah, I'm not married. Well, if you're thinking about marriage, this is what you're thinking about. This is the standards that Christian husband and wives are called to. Submission and leadership in Christ. Maybe those of you uh, or some of you are in completely other stations in life. And you are probably, you know, would, would never be married. Maybe Christ has called you to singleness. Maybe you're a widow and so on. If that's you, pray for your brothers and sisters who are married. We need your prayers. We do. Marriage is wonderful, but it's difficult. It takes a great deal of effort. Pray for us. Minister to your brothers and sisters who are married. To the married here this morning, let us boldly and sacrificially obey the Holy Spirit by fulfilling our calling to our spouse. But to all of us, married, unmarried, male, female, let's submit to God by submitting to every authority he places over us. We do that in faith. When we do this, we show we ultimately trust in him. We trust in him to guide us. We trust in him to sustain us. Again, even in those difficult situations, even in places of injustice, we trust in him one day to ultimately vindicate us. Let's pray.